too. <laughs> Making something out of nothing. That's your job here. That's what my supervisor told me as he led me around the post-production offices of the LA studio. I became familiar with that saying as it really was the motto of all the editors and story assistants, which was my official title. A story assistant, at least in the realm of reality TV, helps producers and editors shape the storylines that the producers have set forth for an episode. Then the assistants and editors manipulate all the captured footage into something that brings that story to life. Or if that doesn't work, then the footage can find its own compelling storyline. My job consisted mainly of scrubbing through, which means watching, hours and hours of shot footage, eagle-eyeing it to find moments that, pieced together, could make for a good episode of TV. I was making something out of nothing. I did this for a few different shows. The company highlighted things like ghosts, dogs, cars, treasure hunters, and no, they're not shows you would have ever heard of. I, a lot of cats. I learned a lot about the workings of unscripted TV, which is what we call reality TV. I'd already considered myself a very savvy viewer, hip to the falsities and constructed narratives that such programming uses. However, I hadn't quite realized the extent of the manipulation. An example, in my work with producers and editors, I would need to find footage and dialogue that could help support a storyline of two cast members, which is people playing themselves on the show, getting jealous of one another. A completely fabricated storyline which had no basis in reality. So I would have to comb through several days worth of footage and finally through gnashed teeth, caffeine, awareness, and faith, I'd come across a few words here and there that could be mashed together into a sentence. Frankenbiting, it's called. So let's say I could find a few words like, ugh, are you kidding me? Cast member might have been referring to how hot it was. I'd isolate that dialogue. Another cast member at another time would say, what a bitch, just playfully teasing. Sound bites like that were like finding the end of the rainbow. <laughs> I'd pair those bites with what may seem to be a completely irreproachable look on a participant's face. Somebody squints or turns their head rapidly. I'd isolate those shots and voila, I have constructed the foundation for a scene of two jealous cast members snarking and giving each other dirty looks. Now there were two problems with this job. First, I was good at it. <laughs> Second, I was having fun. It took me a good year for it to sink in all the damage I was doing. I had been manipulating storylines, creating drama and comedy and conflict and all those things that make for good entertainment. Proud of myself for making solid money and rising up the ladder quickly at the company. But I started seeing the effects as a couple of the shows I worked on went into their second seasons. Reports of the cast not getting along were bubbling up and these weren't cobbled together casts. The main show I worked on contained a cast of sand sculptors who had been working together or at least had known each other professionally for years. They were friends and colleagues, people who had created amazing sculptures for years together, who had fulfilling professional lives, even as teams long before an unscripted TV crew showed up at their doorsteps. But Things always change once you get into a second season because people see that they're wanted, needed. One cast member was elevated to producer status while the others weren't. Why? Because he secretly demanded it after a successful season one while the others did not. New producers came into our company and others left. Our budget grew and so did the outrageousness something that every network loves because audiences demand it. But how do you bump up outrageousness? 
you cause some outrage. I had been living in LA for a few years and had heard nonstop reports of how the city changes people and too many jokes about Angelinos being assholes. But I had planted in my feet, vowing to never let that happen to me. I was just working in unscripted TV while trying to break into screenwriting. Just like my editor friends at work, and my producer friends at work, and the supervisors at work, <laughs> and everyone else I knew who worked in unscripted TV. But, okay, so fine, I may have been stuck in the job, but at least I was gaining knowledge and experience, and at least I wasn't becoming an asshole like a lot of my coworkers and bosses. That would not happen. I was making something out of nothing, me, and I was staying true to myself. I settled in for a session one day, my desk clean and my tea hot, ready to make some magic happen, and I scrubbed through footage of the cast members working on a sculpture in Las Vegas, the Den of Sin. The client was a rodeo from Old Vegas on Fremont Street. The sculpture consisted of several parts joined together. There was a rodeo clown, a deck of cards, a roulette wheel, and a rodeo girl riding a bull. Each sculptor had their own portion to work on. All of the participants wore hidden microphones, and often they forgot to turn them off. An unexpected perk of the job was hearing all the things they said when the cameras weren't on them. In this instance, the camera was just pointed in a wide shot on their sculpture. Cut had been called, and the sculptors were milling around, and of course, some of them had left their mics on. I had the idea that maybe I could use something more candid sounding from this time. I was listening and watching, and my idea was not proving fruitful, so I was just about to fast forward. But then I heard on the tape the set, the onset producer call out to one of the participants. I saw Stanley, the season two cast member slash producer, walk in front of the camera and then out of sight. He walked over to the producer and I knew this because his mic picked up their conversation. The producer on set proposed a plan that he had cooked up. He wanted to destroy part of the sculpture overnight so that when the cast arrived again in the morning to finish it, they'd have to start all over on a major portion of it, thus providing a thrilling beat the clock scenario for the show. Could they finish before the big client shows up? I expected to hear Stanley say, hello, we've worked hard and we're almost finished. Instead, he said, sure, okay, why don't we smash up the bull? I was gonna ask Brad to fix its nose anyway. So easily had Stanley changed over the course of one season into a part of the club. This, unfortunately, was reality. I sat there shocked, my headphones on at my desk, wrapped by this sudden new storyline, one I couldn't use for the episode, but I kept listening. What ensued was elaborate scheming over how to stage the destruction and make it appear as if drunken Vegas vandals destroyed Brad's part of the sculpture, leave some cups and debris at the scene, break the barrier that was supposed to protect the artwork, and then Stanley returned to sculpting as if nothing important had just happened. I kept listening and watching, no longer focused on what I needed to do for actual work. I watched through the video and finally, there it was, after a lapse in the footage, the following morning. The sculpture looks great, except for the now demolished bull that had been Brad's piece. Cast arrives at the sculpture to begin work, and all of them freak out over what they see. Even Stanley, who has officially made the, the transition from a know-nothing cast member to a know-everything producer. Oh no, what the hell, I can't believe it. After they all walk around surveying the scene, Brad realizing that there's no fixing this, only beginning again, they talk about how they have to be ready with the art by 5 p.m. They start to panic. Stanley just reiterates that, all right, well, it's go time, gang. They all start to dig in. When Brad stops everything, 
and calls out to that on-set producer. Now, I had to make sure at this point that no one could see me pretty much just watching TV. <laughs> not taking notes, not using any of my editing keyboard buttons, not making any new files, just glaring at the screen, wearing my headphones. And yes, Brad left his microphone on. As the camera stayed on a static shot of the demolished sculpture, I could hear the conversation between Brad and the sneaky producer. This looks fishy to me. What do you mean? This whole thing, it doesn't make any sense. We had a security guard and I'm thinking about it and it doesn't make sense and I'm thinking that this is fake, that this is a setup. Dude, what are you talking about a setup? Then Brad calls Stanley over. Brad repeats the same words to him. Stanley also feigns surprise and ignorance. What do you mean a setup? It's like I can hear Brad piecing it all together in his head. You know what I think? I think you guys did this. And I think you knew about it. Stanley says, whoa, whoa, man. I have no idea what you're talking about, but I showed up here same time as you. There's a big pause. Then, tell me you didn't do it, Stan. I couldn't see him, just the smashed sculpture. But I could hear his voice, the hurt in it, the loss of all his work, what he was so proud of, what he loved to do, not just for the money or the TV show, but for the joy in it for the friendship. And this wasn't entertaining anymore. It wasn't juicy. You look me in the eye and tell me you didn't do this and I'll get back there and I'll start over. But I need you to tell me you had nothing to do with this. For just a second, there was quiet. Then Stanley says, I'm telling you, man, I didn't do this. Okay then. Brad walks back across the frame of the shot and kneels down, begins his work. There is no more dialogue between the producer and Stanley. Stanley walks over to his portion of the sculpture and hones his carving. I sat there and instead of snapping out of it and getting back to my own work, I started crying. I was overwhelmed. I felt complicit. I felt as if I had been on that set tearing down Brad's bowl sculpture. As long as I was cutting, pasting, frankenbiting, manipulating, crafting pieces of random footage into good TV, I was fucking with these people. It wasn't just silly entertainment where, yeah, audiences know it's fake. I betrayed these participants' feelings. I hid their realities. I was making something out of nothing. My newfound hatred for my job showed immediately. I had, no, I had what is known in the working world as a bad attitude, and I wasn't a team player. I became an asshole. I habitually talked back to shitty TV bosses when you're supposed to just put up with it. I held on because I needed a paycheck, but only lasted another few months before I got fired. I haven't watched an unscripted show in six years, refusing to be a part of the manipulation of both the audience and the cast. Except, I did recently discover The Great British Baking Show. <laughs> A handful of well-intentioned and delightful contestants under a tent in a meadow <laughs> bake their lovely hearts out while little sheep bleat nearby in warm, tall grass. And the judges of the participants' efforts are like recipients of great parenting awards 
They're supportive, giving handshakes and back pats, and at worst, expressing a firm disappointment when a, <laughs> when a cast member leaves their dough in the proving drawer for too long. <laughs> it's the perfect show to watch before bed. It lulls me to sleep as I think about how this could be real. This could be how things really are. People could be this nice, this undramatic, this good to each other. It's a glimpse of peace. And when one of the contestants' ovens breaks, <laughs> throwing their project into chaos, that's just a coincidence, right? <laughs> Jennifer D. Corley, everybody!